thank you very much for coming. This is the first of two provost forums for this semester, uh, starting with analytics, and then the second forum will be about gen ed, gen ed outcomes, uh, and gen ed options and ideas. I don't know when it is, but I know it is. So, <laughs> November 21st. Uh, it's coming. So my role today is to say welcome. My name is Faye Gilbert. I'm the interim executive vice president for academic affairs and provost as well as Dean of the Undergraduate School of Business for the main business school, longest title I've ever had in my life. Uh, but for today, I am very fortunate in being able to simply say I, am, I think we have some gifted people at the University of Maine, and you're going to have the fortune of hearing from a couple of them today as we walk through analytics, a little bit of bright space, and as you interact, hopefully, uh, with this session, that'll be about the future going forward of, of academics and where we're headed. So I will leave it to you to introduce yourselves, even though you probably know everybody. Uh, still introduce yourselves for those like me that may be newer and not know everybody. And I thank you very much for being here. I'm uh, Deb Allen. I'm the Assistant Provost for the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment. And I'm Peter Schilling from the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our hope is that this quickly turns into a conversation. Uh, essentially, Deb and I are going to have a conversation, so we're inviting you to join in. Um, and actually, I, I should sort of, I, I didn't tell Deb this, uh, but I put all these slides together, and she doesn't know that I can't spell. Um, so I'll take uh, responsibility for any egregious errors. I can't spell egregious either. Um, so we wanted to start and talk a little bit uh, very briefly, um, and some of this is obvious once you say it, but of course education is always a part of and reflects the culture in which we exist. So, um, you know, in a, in a specific industrial culture, we organized instruction, not unlike this room today, um, in which we had a theory of how people learned, where they started, what we, knew, what we needed to know about them, um, and how they progressed forward uh, in education. Um, times have changed um, since the Model T. Uh, our classrooms necess haven't necessarily changed quite at, at the same speed, but if you think about the culture in which we're living today, we do Google searches. And Google works because it's a database of you know, millions and millions of searches, and the uh, artificial intelligence informs it of uh, what to, to present to us. We shop on Amazon and see a list of recommended other things for people who bought this. Um, we have Fitbits that uh, are gathering little bits of data that inform the way we sleep and the way we exercise, et cetera. So we're already in uh, a really uh, rich information culture. Um, and in fact, we are starting to change some of our instructional spaces. This is over in Estherbrook on, on the first floor. And this is a, a really different environment in which uh, you know, all the students have at least one device, if not two or three. Um, there's a ton of data that's being collected in that room, as well as uh, by the students when they're interacting with the learning management system, as well as when they apply to the university, et cetera. That's all present um, and could be available to us, uh, as well as to them. So we're talking today about learning analytics. So I'll offer a quick definition so that we're all in the same place. And it, it really uh, revolves around those three words, but I'll, I'll read the definition. Um, so collect, analyze, and report reporting of data about learners and their context for purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment, environments in which it occurs. Learning analytics can focus on student progress, behavior, and learning. I'm going to quickly differentiate that from, uh, we could call it academic analytics or just business analytics. So for decades, if not longer, this university and every other college and university in the country has been collecting uh, information about, uh, you know, from HR, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, financial, other administrative areas about how we do our work. If folks from uh, auxiliary services were here, they would give you data on how many students are in the dorms, what the, the traditional uh, uh, loss rate is semester to semester. You know, they have all that data. All of us have that data. IT functions because it has a bunch of data about how many devices are on campus. So we have a bunch. But what we're not yet doing is uh, moving that into the actual learning space. Um, I'll quickly say 
we're not the first to have this conversation. Uh, this conversation has been happening uh, across the country at institutions that don't look that different from us, uh, maybe a little bigger. Um, but you know, public uh, research institutions around the country, private institutions as well. Um, there's also uh, many companies that are, are trying to help facilitate the gathering and use of data around learning. So IBM Watson has an education division that's focused on this. Um, a faculty member in physics at Harvard sold a company he spun off in the co collection of data from student response systems, clickers, and feeding that in through the learning management system. And he sold it to Pearson, who similarly has services in this space. Uh, we've probably heard of EAB, and, and Civitas is another company similar to that, though this one, the commercial, that's been around for more than a decade that helps uh, institutions gather, crunch, analyze, uh, and present data. And then uh, I wanted to also sort of highlight that there is a, a consortium of about 25 public R1s across the country, and these are some of the largest, the Nebraska's, the UT Austin, uh, Ohio State, and many others, that have created a consortium uh, in part around learning analytics to help uh, um, figure out the best data to collect, how to collect it, how to present it, when to present it. Um, so we're not starting from scratch in this space. In addition, um, there is uh, substantive research that's been going on for decades. This happens to be just one journal, uh, academic journal in learning analytics. Um, it's been out there for quite a while. And these are, are just a, a small handful of institutions that offer degrees, uh, graduate degrees or certificates in learning analytics. So we're not going into uh, a space that, that we have to carve our own path. There's a lot of precedent out there. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the analytics maturity. So there's a lot of analytics maturity models out there. I'm going to the one I'm going to talk about is one um, uh, published by Gartner, which is a research firm that specializes, well, studies analytics. Um, and and Gartner uses four phases for when you think about analytics maturity. The first is descriptive. Um, descriptive analytics is really what is what is going on. So it would be what is student grades and DFWL rates and GP, QM GPA at the, end, in the end of the first year. Those are retention rates, graduation rates. Those are example of descriptive analytics, kind of what is going on. And then the next phase gets more into the diagnostic analytics. So this is where you're drilling down to understand the why. Um, this would be if you're going to look at student subgroups or um, look at relationships across variables. That kind of starts to get at the why. When we bring in data from an LMS, it could also look at the student behavior throughout the course to understand why students did poorly or did well in a course. And that gets at the diagnostic part of, of analytics, so a little bit further on looking at, at why things are happening and, and who. Um, the next phase is the predictive. So in the predictive phase um, of maturity, this is where you have a lot of variables that you're studying, uh, historical variables, and you're looking at a particular outcome, whether it be retention or um, failure in a course, and you take those variables and you analyze the, the relationship between those variables and your outcome, and then you build a model, you score your students with that model, and you identify those students who might be at risk. So that's, that's an example of predictive analytics. Um, Peter earlier had, had shown Purdue as, as one um, institution that was further along in the analytics, uh, analytics continuum, and Purdue had developed um, a course signals, I don't know if anyone's heard of course signals, but that their course signals um, program uses predictive analytics to identify students at risk, various levels of risk throughout, at the, throughout the course, so the instructor can identify if they're at risk. Um, I think, if they, they basically it's like a green light, a yellow light, and a red light to identify how students are. And it, their models that they use for that use pre-college indicators, pre-course indicators, so their GPA going into the course, um, how many courses they failed up to that point, as well as behavior as they start that course. So the behavior variables end up uh, are being weighted more heavily in their models. Um, and so that, that is a, an example where you're bringing LMS data and, and SIS data together for a predictive model. 
And the last one is prescriptive. So when you're in the prescriptive, that's where you're really looking at real-time data. So it's, it's kind of like that point where, where you're trying to figure out what, what's the best way to go with this student and, and what, what would be the good path for this student throughout the course. That really gets kind of at the adaptive learning concept with the prescriptive. So we were thinking about where we were as a campus, um, and I can only speak to what I, what I see from the institutional research and assessment side, so, so centrally. I'm sh I know there's pockets on campus where faculty members are, are using predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics and are farther along the continuum. But for my, um, centrally, in terms of data that are readily available, I would say we're more on the descriptive side, starting to become a little bit more diagnostic. So we, for years, our, our um, office, uh, and for years we were mostly focused on the academic analytics side. So enrollment and credit hours and retention graduation rates from, from the institution perspective. Um, we've now moved a little bit more towards looking at student learning, um, looking at relationships between high school GPA and SAT scores and first year retention, or, or success in particular math courses. And we've started to kind of look more at relationships. And then in the last few years, we've had a lot of more requests from faculty members and chairs to dig a little deeper, to look at relationships between how students are doing in a course and how they did in their prerequisite course or how students are doing in particular courses and tying that back to, their, to how well they did in high school, or where they took the prerequisite course. Was it here at UMaine, or did they take it from the, you know, the community college? So we've been asked to do more of those anal analyses lately, so I, I say we're kind of getting more towards the, the diagnostic side of, of the uh, maturity index. So, um, so following up on what Deb said, this is a, a, a screenshot of the, the basic, basic uh, reporting tools that are available in um, Blackboard. And so those of you who use Blackboard, you've probably seen this. This happens to be a class I'm doing this semester. And it's pretty basic. I, I, I know those of you in the back can't see the detail here, but it, it's very basic. Uh, it's, you know, student name, last time they logged in, um, how, how many readings they, they clicked on, uh, how many discussion threads they participated in. I can then go and dig in a little bit deeper on a student and look at, you know, how many words did they put into a discussion thread. But this is still very much at the descriptive level. Um, you know, I, I can individually think, oh, this one student hasn't uh, logged on in, in a week and they're not sort of engaged in a discussion group. But it's not uh, terribly sophisticated in terms of uh, using the data. Similarly, in Kaltura, which is our, our web streaming service, we uh, collect data, or Kaltura collects data, just the way you know any web service does in, in terms of log data. And here, uh, I, for those of you in the back, I have a dozen courses where I just happen to grab, they're all business courses. Uh, um, just Gee, happen that's to, humbling, no pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> all taught by saying, yeah. Um, so just sort of grabbed a, a, a number of courses, and this is just showing, um, how, what percentage of all the videos that were available in each of these dozen courses was actually watched by students. And most fac faculty can't actually see this. As, as sort of a, a CITL staff member, I have access to a bit more. And so the idea is how to get this information so faculty can act on it. But here, you, you see this and you wonder sort of what's happening with course 12, because that's really different than the others. So just as a point of contrast, I grabbed course two, which um, over here, so it's a little higher than average, probably of the whole mix, if you, you don't include 12 in that. Um, and here you see uh, that 26 students, there were 17 videos, uh, and there's a real, you know, some students are very eager and are watching um, the videos in the course more than once, almost double here, but there's a big portion that aren't even watching uh, five of the videos at all, um, or, or more than five. Um, this is still on course two, we find uh, uh, all of the course, all of the videos that are 17 are about an hour and 20 minutes, so they're quite long with one about two hours and 20 minutes, though no one watched that one. I, I have a, a concern that uh, this was set, that it was in a room that was set to record, and it was a day that no one showed up and no one turned it off, which, so that, that, that skews the average of it. Um, and again, I, 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 part of what I take away from this is I don't have enough information to act on this. 
but I want more information because there's some odd trends that I wouldn't fully anticipate. So now on, on to course 12. Uh, this one has 25 students, so one fewer students than the other. And we see a really different pattern here. Um, there are a lot more videos, so 17 to, to 43, yeah? Um, but a greater percentage of students are actually watching those 43. And then what gets very interesting is these videos are very short. So the longest one over there is, I think, about 12 minutes, and the rest are in about the between four and six minute range, and a much higher proportion of these videos are watched. Again, I don't know enough to, to really have concrete conclusions from this data, but I want to combine it with information that Deb has. I want to combine it with information uh, from the LMS. I want to talk with the faculty member, um, you know, what's happening. But this is pretty, uh, knowing this kind of thing, I think it, it could inform in a really useful way how a faculty may go about developing their course. Um, and this is an example, I'm just going to give an example of uh, this descriptive analytics from um, using SAS data only. Um, so this just starts with a course that has a 30.5% DFWL rate. So this is a course, and this is just first year, so over 30% of the students in this, first year students in this course received a DFWL. Um, so we can drill down to that even further with our descriptive information, um, and this pulls in their pre-college indicators, because this is, this is, these are students taking this course their first semester. So uh, we have a, so what we call the C index, which is our, it's an index that equally weights high school GPA and SAT. Whether or not it's the best predictor for this course, it's just I wanted to use this as an example. Um, we may want to more heavily weight certain things in this course, but this is just a simple example of uh, descriptive analysis. So here you can see this is the, this is the lowest uh, C index, less than 70. And you can see in that group, 64% of the students um, received the DFWRL. In contrast, the students that had the really high C index of 90 or higher, almost all the students performed, you know, had received a uh, higher grade than a D. Um, and then in this middle range here, in the 70 to 74 and 75 to 79, it's still notably higher, but it's not quite as, quite as clear. Um, and we really need additional variables. So this is just kind of gives you a top line, but it doesn't give you, there's additional variables to take into account um, what course, if we had what courses they took in high school, but we don't have those readily available to us, um, whether they're first generation, um, what, what high school they came from. So that information could be brought into this, but as well as what happened in the course. At what point did these students in the course, did things start to, to did they start to falter in the course? Which would be data that we could, could bring in from the LMS. Um, the next is an example. Um, this further breaks this down by gender. Again, just a descriptive analysis. But in this, you can see that the females did better than the males in that lowest group. So 60% of the females received the DFWL compared with 65% of the males. But when, you, when you're in the 70 to 80 range, the males did, did better than the females. So again, this is an example of kind of looking at the descriptive, but starting to drill down. And the next slide is just an example, and it's kind of hard to see, but where, where we looked at grades in a course by their grade in the prerequisite course. Um, so, so this is students in the prereq who received an A or an A minus, a B, B plus, or a B minus, or a C, or a, a C plus, and, and students needed to have a C in order to, to get this particular course. Um, and you can see that in the, the B, B plus, B minus range, um, 42% of the students did not receive, received a grade below B, B plus or, or B minus. Um, and then in the C and C plus range, these are students who received at least the minimum they needed to get into this course, there were 22 students who, 22% um, of the students received, um, didn't receive a C, received a D or, D or worse. So um, again, this is descriptive, but it's starting to kind of get into the why, um, but it does not, we still need additional data that ideally we could bring this all together. So this brings us to the point of, of today. Um, so Deb will talk some more about EAB and, and Navigate and what it brings to the, the table. And then I'll go a little bit in what Brightspace, uh, the Desire to Learn learning management platform, is, is going to offer. So right now, um, 
we have data that are somewhat somewhat in silos, but with Navigate, things are feed in to Navigate a little bit more. So um, in our Main Street admission side, we have information on students' high school GPA, their SA, how they did in their SAT, their ACT, what high school they came from. Um, we have certain demographics, whether they're in-state, out-of-state as well. We have Main Street data for student record side. We have their um, AP scores, their math placement exam data. We have data on how well they've done so far, what their GPA is and their grades to date. Um, and these things, they, they kind of sit on, on their own. And then some of these data then flow into Navigate. Now, I don't know if everyone knows what Navigate is, but Navigate is a um, student-facing app and an advisor-facing platform. And this is related to the advisor-facing platform. So the advisor-facing flat platform is used by advisors. It gives them advisors an ability to contact their students. It gives their advisors an ability to look at their student data. Um, they can quickly see their students' history, what their students are enrolled in, what courses they've dropped to date. They can quickly see their SAT scores. Their, and I'm looking at Kim because Kim is the Navigate coordinator. So um, they can see their um, AP scores and all, all of the data related to their student they can see in one place. Um, also in Navigate, what we've started to do, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, is this semester was our first um, time where we started to use it for early alert. So it's an opportunity with Navigate to have an early alert system. So where instructors can put progress reports into Navigate and then those can flow to the advisors. We piloted this year with, with three courses um, and it went very well. We're going to pilot more in the spring with some additional courses. So these things all, and then the other is the next big thing. So I guess we know that this is the current state, but there's, we know that there will be additional data available to us in the future, that there'll be something else that's going to feed into it, and maybe Navigate will be something else in the future, but, but these are starting to connect um, a little bit more. So then on the, the learning management side, um, we have uh, had, Currently, it's, it's Blackboard. It will become Brightspace, but we also have data from Zoom, Kaltura, from Google itself, if uh, faculty are using the Google Apps for Ed. Uh, and I'll, I'll delve here a little deeper into Brightspace. Uh, when we were looking at the submissions by the three companies who responded to our RFP for a learning management system, one of the key factors that we uh, asked all of them about was the data that they collect and, and um, how easily can we look at it? How easily can we download it and import it into another space? Um, and one of the things that really uh, uh, helped us decide on Brightspace was the it's very open with its data, its capacity to export it into others in very simple structured ways was by far the highest. There are no additional fees as with one of the other vendors, Canada, that required that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really, uh, this was one of the factors that, that tipped the scale. Um, I'll offer, and here too, we know these things are going to change. Um, I didn't mention clickers in, in this space, but that's another uh, uh, potential source of data that could flow into here, and, and it will grow over time. That said, is, uh, the, the next important step is actually to bring both the in the moment during the semester data in with the, the rich data that Navigate can. So the, right now, we, um, Navigate, the EAB, is um, working on a way to flow data from Brightspace into Navigate. That wasn't a possibility with Blackboard, at least it hadn't been. Um, but they are right now working on that functionality. So what we're hoping is the, Navigate, the data in, Navi in the learning management system will be able to flow into Navigate, which will facilitate that early alert, being able to, to communicate to advisors um, early if students are faltering as well. And, and Navigate also, um, one thing I didn't mention was Navigate also collects information from students in the app that flows through into the tool. So information on students' interests. Um, and there's also, we can do quick polls to pull in information from students throughout the semester. And that data all also fo flows into Navigate as well. One of the other uh, distinguishing elements of, of Brightspace is, um, I'm going to use an analogy that if we think of, uh, or often in the past when we thought of learning management systems such as Blackboard, we thought that that was the set of tools we were, we were able to use, right? So we use Blackboard's discussion tool, we use Blackboard's web conferencing tool, we use Blackboard's gradebook, et cetera, et cetera. 
one of the shifts, and Blackboard's doing this as well, but Brightspace is, is very much there, is it's more of a hub. It's not the, the, the beginning and, and end of the ecosystem, it's a hub into which we plug things. Now, having said that, we do plug in Zoom into Blackboard, we do plug in Kaltura to Blackboard, et cetera, but this is more, will happen more and more as we go forward, and Brightspace is already oriented in that regard, and also oriented to, to collect and and analyze and process the data from those other sources. Right? Um, so this is just a few screenshots um, from Navigate. So this this shows, and it's hard to see, but this this shows the um, the page that advisors see when they, they enter to Navigate, and you can see they can see what students they have as advisors, and they can see their appointment campaign starting in the in the spring, students will be able to schedule, ideally, students will be able to schedule their appointments or advisors through the app. So that will flow through. Um, advisors will have their calendars get synced up with Navigate, um, and students will be able to look at the app and see the availability. Um, so advisors can keep track of their upcoming appointments, they can look at what their availability is set at, um, and then they can look at any appointment requests, but they can also see, and I'll show you that in a minute, extensive information about their students. Um, and then for the instructors of record, they can see all their students in their classes and then they can also see alerts that they've issued as well. So the instructors of records can issue, like I mentioned before, this can be used as the early alert system which we're starting to roll out. Um, and this is an example of, and it's, it is really hard to see, um, but this is an example of the option for issuing an alert, and we have a set of alerts that are built into the system. Um, as I mentioned before, we've had, we're piloting it this, this fall. Uh, we have three courses that we're piloting this with. Um, the first alert was based on attendance and logging into the LMS. The second alert was based on grades, and then we have a third alert right before, when they, the last week that they have to, to uh, withdraw from the class with a W is the last alert that we have this semester. So, um, so this is where faculty members would put in an alert on a student. And then um, this is a profile for the students. And this shows their GPA and their, um, the courses that they're taking. There's a, there's a class schedule. But it also shows their interests. This right here is information on um, some of their interests that they, they uh, answer questions in the app as well. So that flows to the advisor as well. And in here in one place, you can also see their minors in one place, and you can also see whether an athlete, uh, if they're an athlete, what sport they are. You can see in one place whether they're a first generation, I think that's flowing through now. If it's not, it's going to. Um, and whether they're an online only student. So you can see all that information in one place and navigate. So it, it's providing a comprehensive uh, set of information in one page. Um, in addition, advisors can um, set up campaigns to communicate to their students as well. So whether it be they want to send out an email to their students to set up an appointment to, for advising in, in the fall, or whether they want to send out an enrollment campaign, they have the option of sending out campaigns as well to navigate. So here's a, a couple of uh, the reporting screens from Brightspace, and, and uh, I mentioned to, to Faye at the outset, I got access to my Brightspace sandbox on Monday. Um, so this is sort of a, a very cookie cutter um, uh, view of what, what we'll get. Um, but right, th so this is the class profile, so the, the uh, I'm sorry, class progress, so a faculty member would be able to log into his or her course, see all the students are in there. They can, um, the, the headings across the top, the column heads, the faculty gets to decide what those are, um, you know, on the, on the fly, and then uh, drilling down into one student, sort of the, the list of, uh, of items along the side here. Um, the faculty member goes and sort of selects each one of them and they can see the data that's important to them um, for each student on an ongoing basis. And so part of the idea is, you know, let's spend some time and understand sort of everything that's available in, in Brightspace, but do we want to think about how to uh, export some of this? And, and again, it's very easy to export data out of Brightspace. So then we get to, to, to the point in which we're thinking about where do we go next. Um, one of the things that, that we want to make sure that you all understand is that this isn't an IT project. It's not that IT is going to come with a fully formed 
bright space and it's going to have all the learning analytics that we need in exactly the way we want them telling us the information that we need. It's actually going to be something that becomes part of all of our jobs, right? The, the data collection, the, the, the making sure that the data is, is flowing where it needs to flow, that the right folks have access to it, all that kind of stuff. It needs to actually permeate the, the work of the university. And one of the one of the the there was a recent Educause report in 2016 that outlined all the steps you would take um, to develop a strategy. So I think the first thing we need to do we would need to do moving forward is develop a strategy and also develop policies. So we know that policies are necessary around, for example, student privacy. So that policies would need to be developed there. Also, strategy. Um, thinking about maybe starting small, not biting off more than we can chew at the beginning. But this, as Peter said, this has to be collaborative, so it's, it's not just an IT, but it, IT needs to be involved. It's, it's critical, because ITs, they're the ones who are gonna be putting it all together. They're, they're going to be building the architecture for this. But it also needs to be academic affairs, CITL, um, Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, as well as faculty, and that, that's critical that faculty are, are major part of this, or the most important part, because faculty will be the ones that will be using the data for their teaching. So that is, that's a critical part, part of this. And Peter had shown earlier the institutions that are further along in this. And when, we've been, when we were researching for this, one of the things that I noticed was all those institutions have these big groups of people that are focused on learning analytics um, as, you, as you move forward. Um, that, and it's usually across campus. In some cases, I guess, it's, it's shops that are devoted to it. But a lot of times, it's task force and working groups that are all devoted to discussing this and planning this as you move forward. So I think that's the biggest thing to remember is to right. that part of it. Yeah. And so Do we have a sign-up sheet? <laughs> 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 yeah. We have you on camera. This yes. is yeah, <laughs> facial recognition. <laughs> and, all the ones yeah. who are not here that volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. And but un underlying all of this is, is sort of a, a shift to become a culture of information. Um, and the ways in which uh, we do that. And it, it's not imposed uh, right. on anyone, and it's not one group that, that manages all of this. We all have to decide what's the important information for us to do our jobs, and are, is there ways in which, uh, in a sense, all around us is a, this information that we're just not uh, collecting and, remember, uh, collecting, analyzing, and presenting in ways that can inform what we do. So this will be spring, there will be training programs of how to set up Brightspace, and as part of that, will there be questions of what information is going to flow back? Or So uh, one of the ways that we're, great question, thank you. Uh, one of the ways that we're organizing the rollout of Brightspace is um, to have sort of uh, the Educational Technology Advisory Committee, which is a, a system-wide group, sort of thinking about the strategies, the overarching timing, the contract negotiations, those kinds of things. But when it gets to something like um, what kind of learning analytics should we have, uh, we're going to form task groups um, so that we have the people who, like Deb and others, who really uh, are deeply involved in the data, and, and you all, uh, who think about sort of what would be useful for me to when I'm teaching or when I'm advising a student, sort of staff those task forces that help advise how we should rule it out. Because again, um, this isn't something that we hand to IT and say, you figure it out for us. Um, we have to do that. We have to sort of uh, be the ones who are thinking about exactly what we need. Um, so that's going to happen, that's going to start happening you know, uh, this month next, that we're going to start putting those task force together. In terms of the training for Blackboard, yes, that's going to happen starting in this uh, Blackboard. <laughs> Bright space. Um, some people have actually have started calling it black space. But <laughs> um, so the, the training on that will happen. Uh, start the CITL staff, the IT staff are starting training now, um, and then we'll move to start training faculty in the spring and, and throughout the summer. Because the start date is fall. Yes. And so with the, the, the transition, it seems will have to occur before May for the courses that are scheduled for fall, because there won't be time when people come back to then set up Brightspace would be my guess. 
Uh, there's a short window. There's a short window. back on the first and classes start the third or something. So right. in a day, you can't do this. No. Yeah, so uh, this is, again, I got my sandbox on Monday. Um, <laughs> My, my suspicion the way it's going to happen is uh, for those courses that are in Blackboard, and there's many that aren't, for those that are in Blackboard, we'll come up with strategies for bulk migrating them over, mm -hmm. and then work one-on-one uh, -on -one with faculty as needed to say, okay, we moved everything over, did everything fall where you wanted, did any, were there any hiccups? We'll do that a couple times before we actually start working with the faculty so that we can preempt any of the hiccups. But then we'll move that, and we'll use that time also to train the faculty in how to use Brightspace. So here's your course um, that we migrated over. Let's sort of go through it, make sure everything landed where it needed to go. Things, you know, your announcements will probably not be public because the dates don't work anymore. And so how to, how to work through in a granular level. And we'll, given the volume of, of courses, my suspicion is this goes on for a year. So we'll, we'll focus on in the spring and the summer, the, the fall courses, and then in the fall, we'll start focusing on winter and fall, um, and really plan this, it, it's gonna be a 24-month activity. I'm happy to answer questions about that if, if, if folks have them. Or go back into the learning analytics and dig into that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm just trying to I get a good understanding of the, the learning analytics piece, but it, so it seems like there are, there are many variables that that come into play that you could analyze to help you predict any any one thing that you want to predict on. And so I, so I've got multiple questions going on in my head, but I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to say one or ask one. Are there um, are there sets of variables that that you would that you bring together that you, to come together to do some um, predictive analytics. So in other words, some of the institutions that you mentioned before are already, you know, working in, with predictive analytics. So they probably have, if they want to, if they want to understand or be able to predict on X, that they know that these variables, you know, variables A, B, C, D, and E are the ones that will best inform, um, you know, the, the outcome for this. It, do you see what I'm saying? I, I'm wondering if there are different sets of variables that have already, that, that could already help us uh, get started. Yeah. So we don't have to create everything from the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, and that's part of the reason I brought up Unison uh, as a group that has already sort of paved the way. And mm -hmm. so potentially joining that group or somehow getting what are, what are the sets of variables that in the, in the X number of years that they've been around have shown to, to actually be pretty predictive. Uh, similarly, and part of the reason with the open source, Moodle, and then uh, the other big open source learning management system is called Sakai. Um, they're, because they're open source, we can go and see what their data is, what are the variables that they're collecting. And um, the, the journal I mentioned too, sort of is regularly reporting on, and, and faculty are doing research on what are the predictive. Um, so I think the, the first task of, of our University of Maine task force is let's go and, and start small as, as as Deb recommended. But what are some of the what's the low hanging fruit that we should go and get right away that maybe is relatively easier to, to access, um, but we can get into folks' hands right away. And then you know the, the faculty will say you know this is good. Now I understand. I want these other three things as well. Mm -hmm. um, but let, let's we want to get that ball rolling. Um, but it really is going to take us to do it. Mm -hmm. Parada, I think you had it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, so while you're starting to think about the task force that's going to figure out what assessment information the institution wants, there are programs within the university that have their own assessment strategies. That At what point do we then get to sort of jump in there and tailor it for our own program assessment? Um, I would jump in early. Um, and, you know, because I, my suspicion is that um, we can all learn from each other uh, and not sort of say, okay, we're going to do something in isolation and then we'll start learning from people who've been doing this for a while. I'd rather uh, recruit to the task force folks who have a, a background in doing this and, and using data in any way possible, and that can inform the whole. Now, it could well be that, and now I'm completely hypothetical, that 
Bio is doing something that is so idiosyncratic that no one else at the university would would even have access to the raw data that would inform them. So maybe that doesn't that's not low hanging fruit. But let's understand what all of that is uh, as early as possible, and then we build a roadmap. Great question, though. Thanks. Yeah, Natasha. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, in a situation like we have in math department, where there be multiple sections of a course and there's a course coordinator, I'm wondering what sort of uh, powers that course coordinator might have or functions that that course coordinator could play in terms of helping often very brand new faculty or other people uh, to manage their courses and what sort of integration there might be between um, the, the systems you're talking about and navigate so that, for example, if we decided as a course we wanted to give all students who scored a certain grade on the first test a warning, that that could be done centrally instead of it having to be the individual responsibility of these overworked brand new faculty? Yeah. It's a great question. I'll start on the bright space side of things. And uh, you recall this, whoops. Um, so future state. So we're going to shortly be here, right? So I, I think Deb and I could talk, uh, answer your question a little bit for here right now, um, but then start thinking about how we get to there. So in the, um, what you're describing on the bright space side of things is, is a role. So how could a, um, a, a curriculum coordinator in a department have a role where they could help the faculty of record in their courses get things set up and, and coordinating and training and that you know, basic stuff. And, and I would say this is very pedagogically specific to math, so CITL is not going to be any help to you at all, because I can't do math along with spelling. Um, um, so one of the task force that we're about to form is also what roles do we need? Uh, within. So the faculty role is easy, the student role is easy, the, the, the Uber administrator role of, of IT is easy, but then there's the TA, there's a grader, there's CITL, there, you know, so hearing that, um, that uh, a curriculum coordinators in department having a bit, uh, having a role that gives them access, maybe they don't see grades, maybe they, you know, that's where I want to bring that task force together, because again, this is not something that we ask IT to do. This is something where we tell them, uh, we've thought this through, these are the roles that we need and why. Uh, and they'll come back and say, do you know by doing X, you, you've exposed all these other things, could you do it, which is a great conversation to have. So that's the. Yeah, and on the Navigate side, it's somewhat similar. So in this situation, the coordinator is not listed as the instructor of record of any of these courses. They might be teaching one section, one of seven mm -hmm. sections. But they oversee, but they're not listed on all of them. As the, yeah. And I think that's a user role question as well in Navigate, because right now there would be no access to, to those courses. But that's an interesting question uh, to think about for in user roles. Kim, have you is this has this, this come up in the conversations to date? Uh, so uh, this so is this SB, is Kim Stewart, who's the uh, Navigate coordinator. In Main Street, we have a way to assign people to courses and say they're teaching zero percent of the courses. So we would probably on the Main Street side, because Navigate gets all of its roles from Main Street, so we would say the coordinator is teaching 0% of this course, but they're tied to it, and then on Navigate, they could run the progress report for all of the courses. That's really good. Yeah. Right, please. So Peter, I'll change the topics a little bit. Uh, how many people will be on campus to help faculty move over into Brightspace? Because as Provost just mentioned, I mean, we need to do this by the end of yep. May. Yep. Ideally, at the early part of May. Uh, you know Peter submitted a wonderful request uh, to the system for financial support to hire additional people uh, to assist. And we are awaiting word from the system as to what the actual financial support will be that they can provide. So we, we put in a, a substantial request uh, uh, for different things in a, in a, in a timeline, and I, I really appreciate the work. I think it helped the system begin to see, oh, this isn't just tell faculty to go do new things. <laughs> <laughs> and so to underline that, so uh, I actually um, coordinated with USM and uh, University of Maine Augusta we all sort of counted up the total number of courses to be migrated, the total number of faculty. We, do, we, we talked about, you know, we're not going to bring a group together and teach them how to 
to, to work in their course, it's really going to be that one-on-one -on -one type of thing that I just described. We all use the same formula, and we all presented, you know, based on over 900 faculty. This is what uh, we think with, um, you know, I forget the exact number of courses per semester, and so we use that to, to uh, generate uh, what, um, how many hours it's going to take per fact to, to train everybody on campus, and that that's the the data underlying the request that we've made, and we are eagerly awaiting for that <laughs> response too. I had no idea that you had done that and collaborated. That is great. That is, that is great. That's the system teaching each other how to move forward from a stronger place mm -hmm. to, to get it done. That could be why they were so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a question going back to learning analytics, which is that, like, from what I understand, like, there will be a set of variables that we were talking about that, like, that every course will probably, like, focus on a set of variables that it will collect, that will inform its, uh, the teaching. So I was just wondering that like, because it, different courses will use different sets of variables, I'm assuming, is that, like, is that something that you're anticipating or is it just everybody, like, you know, will the task force be like, everybody is going to use these same set of variables? Mm. And so, what will that mean yeah. for the data as a whole collected? Yeah, my, my suspicion is, um, you know, I, I'm not saying, again, this is, my suspicion, we, ha we haven't done the task force work, that there might be, you know, let's say, say two dozen variables that we think about at the outset, and not every one of those is going to be relevant to every course and every instance in every course. Even throughout the semester, you, you might not do quizzes in, you know, mid-November to the end, so why pay attention to that? And if you, th oops, if you take a look, so these, in a sense, would, could be some of the variables. This is the, the out of the box, the variables that Brightspace will provide, and this is even a subset of them. And so I could see sort of nesting a set of variables in a, in a similar type of report. So you come to yours and you're like, well, you know, in, in my area, we don't do discussions. I'm a math teacher, we do problem sets and we share those. So you're looking at, at assignments in ways that I do base, I, most of my stuff is discussion, so you and I would have the same report or dashboard, but we would be zeroing in on different things that our courses are populating. So I don't, it's not going to be, you know, my, I don't think it will work if it's a really very small set of things that, that don't represent sort of the, the breadth of courses and the ways in which we teach. I'm just curious, in terms of the analytics that you want to capture, is it being considered how this might support accreditation activities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, another feature that uh, really sort of helped Brightspace stand apart was um, its capacity to collect uh, data across multiple courses. So you could set program uh, objectives and how students are achieving them course to course, and then on an administrative level, collect that uh, for accreditation. Um, and yeah, and, and we're our um, the we have a, my office's assessment is within our office, and we've been starting to really dig into that and under, kind of get a better sense of what's available there and what's coming, because I think right now um, there's a, there's a set of learning outcomes, for example, that they, that flow in, into Brightspace, but they're not as customizable. But the next, my understanding is that they're planning to this year where we can do customizable learning outcomes and really tie at the program level, not just the course level. So, so. there could be flexibility from program to program yeah. to capture different types of data. That's our understanding right. where, it, where it's going, yes. That would be very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we could build that, absolutely, I think we could build that in there, I think that would be, um, that's the ideal situation is where we can, since we already have this, that this is what we're looking at right now uh, for what we can do with assessment data. Please. Um, I'm curious, sort of beyond the challenge of migrating systems, um, what kinds of support would be available for faculty in terms of thinking through what kinds of questions to ask about teaching and learning? Um, but, and how to use existing research potentially to inform those questions is sort of one part. 
And then the second part is it strikes me that the power of this kind of analytics brings in ethical, some ethical considerations also, and I wonder if that's something where there will be some support. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll start with the first part in terms of uh, above and beyond, if you will, the mechanics of migrating and getting up and running. Part of the reason that uh, we put in requests for additional resources for the migration is uh, I wanted to preserve the, uh, I felt it was my responsibility to preserve the CITL staff who work with faculty regularly to continue working with faculty on their courses. Um, because if, if we have to spend all of our time on migrating courses and getting folks set up, we're not doing that work. Um, so the, the short answer to your question is we will continue to do that um, as, as we are today. Uh, on the, the I'll pause there and, and see if, if you have additional questions on that part before I go into the second part of your question. Um, no, I, I guess I think it would be good if we worked together more on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So then the second is on the ethical considerations, and that's something that uh, Deb and I have talked about, we think is one of the first topics that the task force should start addressing, is, is who has access, when do they have access, when do we anonymize and, and all of those kinds of things? Who can do research based on that? Um, you know, all of, all of that uh, we still need to work through. Please join me in saying thank you for this wonderful. <laughs>